The views, information, or opinions expressed during AOA broadcast series are solely those of the individuals involved and do not necessarily represent those of the American Academy of Allergic Allergy, its employees, or members. The AOA is not responsible and does not verify for accuracy any of the information contained in and assumes no liability for any activities in connection with these broadcasts. The primary purpose of this broadcast series is to educate and inform and does not constitute medical or other professional advice or services. Advertising, which is incorporated into, placed and associated with, or targeted toward the content of this product without express approval and acknowledgement of the AOA is forbidden. These broadcasts are available for private, non commercial use only and may not be edited or modified from their original form or reproduced for distribution. Well, welcome everyone to our AAOA Zoomcast series. Today, we're gonna to be talking about re-engaging with patients and the impact of telehealth will be a part of this as well. I wanna take a moment to introduce myself and then the other panelists, and we will certainly try to provide a really honest perspective of how we've been managing in our practices, what new strategies we've come up with for marketing, uh, both a hybrid form of practice with telehealth and in-person, and most importantly, how we're making patients feel safe coming to an ear, nose, and throat or an allergist's office to be seen, specifically as they worry about uh, transmission of COVID still in 2021. My name is Aisha Khalid. I am an academic uh, hospital-employed physician in the Boston area at Cambridge Health Alliance. And I mention that because I think practice setting will be, will be important as we're talking about what we're doing and how we're seeing patients. Uh, my conflicts of interest include that I serve on the board of a lot of startups out of MIT, uh, specifically Hacking Medicine um, and also Apex Ventures. And I have done some consulting in the past with Stallergens Greer. And I teach a lot of courses in and around the venture community. So I think the innovation that we teach in our coursework uh, to engineers and computer scientists are in fact things that we're using now as we try to gather this community for you. Uh, so I'm going to go ahead and, and let the speakers introduce themselves as well to really give you an idea and a flavor of where they're from and uh, and what types of obstacles they are facing. So I'll start with you, Dr. Marzouk. Sure, my name is Heidi Marzouk. I am with uh, an academic practice in central New York. I'm with SUNY Upstate uh, Medical Center. So uh, we're actually both academic and uh, a state institution. I have no disclosures or conflicts of interest. Perfect. Next, I'll go to you, Dr. Stackler. Hi, I'm Rob Stackler. I am retired academic, and now I opened up a private practice around three years ago. Uh, I'm in the northern Detroit area, so um, I'm pretty close to where I used to practice, and I do otolaryngic allergy, I do laryngology, do general, and uh, I have nothing uh, to declare as a conflict of interest. Perfect, perfect. And I'm just going in the order of my Zoom screen. So next we have Dr. Paul Neubauer. Hi, everyone. I'm Paul Neubauer. I'm in a, a private practice in Stanford, Connecticut. Uh, it's a group of five doctors. I've been in practice three years now. I do a broad range of general ENT. We all sort of do a fair amount of allergy and sinus and head and neck laryngology, some peds. I'm happy to be here. Uh, no conflicts either. Perfect. And then Dr. Patel. Yes, hi, I'm, I'm Nolan Patel. I'm in private practice in Tampa, Florida, and uh, just started uh, a um, collaborative position with the University of South Florida. And um, my practice is primarily pediatric otolaryngology with a focus on otolaryngic allergy. And I have no conflicts. Perfect, perfect. Um, and then Dr. Steven Hauser. Hi, uh, Steven Hauser. I'm in uh, Cleveland, Ohio at Metro Health Medical Center, uh, academic um, center, and I practice general and rhinology and um, allergic allergy, and I really have no conflicts. I love this because we're spanning the country and we're spanning a lot of different practice types, university affiliations, uh, navigating the murky waters of, of what and how we can market our practice within COVID. So let's go ahead and, and dive in. As you know, we all we all are on uh, podcasts and Zoom casts all day long. We want to make this, this worth your time. So I'm going to go around and, and here's the question that I'm posing really. Please tell us what in 2020, with the majority of the year being the pandemic, and then now 2021 to 2022, 
is the strategy for having patients re-engage with your practice. I know for many of us, there were several months that the practice was either closed or very, very limited. In some places, I'd love to hear if that's still the case, but how are you going about you know, expanding volume, letting patients know you're back open, services are being offered, surgeries are happening. And then underlying that, if you want to comment a little bit on, this sounds crazy, who would have thought that otolaryngic allergists would have to discuss the cleanliness and the safety and the security um, of a patient feeling like the place is clean and, and sort of how much information are you imparting on that? So I'll go ahead and jump around a little bit and I'll start with you, Dr. Hauser. Well, one thing that's been a challenge is actually we have central scheduling. So um, our central schedulers are not in our office directly. So they've had to be informed about what we're doing so that they can pass it on to patients because they're the first contact point for patients. So we actually, yeah, I've had to make sure that they're able to pass on the fact that yes, the clinic is being cleaned. We're wiping down the chairs. The chairs in the waiting area are separated from one another. Uh, everyone is wearing masks and we require the patients to come in wearing masks. Um, so this type of information that we can pass on to try to alleviate their fears. Um, but just in an academic center where we have centralized scheduling, that is a little different than a private practice where you directly can talk to your scheduler. Um, so that's been a, a bit of a challenge, um, but overall, all, uh, all making it very visible to the patients when they come in that we have an MTA out there wiping down all the chairs in between patients and, and so forth, everyone wearing masks. Uh, so everything's very visible to people when they do eventually come in the door. And that word of mouth spreads that, uh, that this is a reasonable place to go. I think, I think two comments in response to that. Uh, scripting. So what you really are bringing up is that there's a lot more scripting and we have that as well. Uh, we also have central scheduling and we've had to design scripts, uh, not only that we're cleaning and that we're open, but that we can't necessarily see you if you currently in the very recent past have been diagnosed with COVID. So I think there's a lot more conversation happening for the schedulers uh, what do you think, Dr. Marzouk? You're in a very different neck of the woods. Um, sure. Anything different that you guys are doing? And, and specifically, how are, is there anything external you're doing to let people know you're open? Sure. So um, we don't have central scheduling in the bulk of our practice where we're practicing allergy. And um, the good news is that we have a core of medical assistants who also are the kind of first line people talking with the patients. So we were able to very early in the pandemic set up telemedicine fairly quickly. So I think that a lot of the patients had comfort in the flexibility, right? So we would have a telemedicine visit, for example, early on, and that was actually a great modality to talk to the patients about their apprehensions um, in terms of the office. So that's number one. Number two was getting the word out, not just to the patients, but actually the referring providers and a lot of the primary care um, providers that refer to us. Because one of the questions we were getting is, are you guys open? Are you guys working? You know, what's going on over there? Can we send patients over? And so actually giving the providers peace of mind that we're open, we have protocols uh, and things like that also gave us a great opportunity to kind of streamline things throughout the pandemic um, to kind of reassure uh, patients. And I think sometimes the way you weave the telemedicine in and out of how you're practicing also um, can help because you can stagger it to the patient's comfort level. And also it helps you kind of um, stagger kind of what you're doing. So you can do with the bulk of your visit one way, reassure them and reassure them that it's going to be you're coming in just for a scope or just for an allergy test or just for this to, to kind of minimize their time in the office. And again, this is kind of more operational wise, but I think that kind of face-to-face -face reassurance was really helpful, uh, especially early on. Have you done a lot of video televisits? Oh yeah. So, so okay. in our practice, we, we uh, initiated really early on, probably mid-March, uh, we uh, established a Zoom platform for our patient visits, um, and we were able to, to utilize that, and especially for, for things like um, 
allergy, rhinology, things like that, where you do really need, you want to do a nasal endoscopy, for example, you do want to perform an allergy test, right? You can do the bulk of your visit via Zoom, right? And via the intake with the MA via Zoom and your, your visit via Zoom, a brief kind of cursory head and neck exam also on the platform. And there are nuances to that. And then you say, okay, I need to do a nasal endoscopy. I would like to allergy test you. You're going to just be in and out just for that procedure visit and also helps you socially distance the patients in the schedule in the office because uh, the, the in-person time kind of cuts down when you do that. You know, we've been using it to kind of integrate where we can be able to space the, the in-person time in the office and just bring people in for those procedural visits because it's also one, you need it for the medical piece because it's a big important part of your 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 diagnostic workup, but it's, you know, revenue-wise, social distance-wise, you know, it has a lot of advantages. Absolutely. This has been a really tough time. A lot of us for the hospital-employed folks were able to be redeployed, were able to be utilized in other capacities, but, um, you know, how are you managing that with private practice, with the telehealth hybrid? with the cleaning, and then also with how this is impacting the reassurance to the staff as well. Sure, that's that's a really good question. And that's, that's part of what I was gonna bring up. I like the way that Dr. Marsuk does the, the hybrid visit with part of it on screen and then you know the kind of pr- a procedure visit. We haven't done that. And what we've done, it has been imperfect for sure, but has worked okay, is that our phones people who are in the office with us, you know, we see them all the time, we hear them on the phone, they have been screening patients about their symptoms. And it is imperfect, especially in the otolaryngology world to screen patients for sore throats. You know, we all know that nine times out of 10, it's not some acute pharyngitis we need to be worried about, it's reflux or something. So, but, so it's been imperfect for sure. So we have had definitely unnecessary telemedicine visits, visits that have been routed to telemedicine once the phones person or somebody kind of screens them and puts them on our schedule. Effectively, it delays their in-person visit a day or two Often it'll be a very quick visit. We'll le- learn that the, the sore throat in fact has been present for three months and then we'll say, why don't you just come in? Um, but it, we could, and maybe this is something you know, we'll do in the future is have a more extensive telemedicine visit and said, hey, you know, certainly with the pandemic, everyone has a risk. Why don't you just come in for the scope and then we'll talk more afterward. Um, so that's sort of interesting. But what we've been doing with this screening has worked okay to, because a lot of times the phones person will put the person on hold and just kind of run something by us. Hey, they said, you know, they have a loss of smell within the last two weeks. That's a little bit different than they haven't really been able to smell for three years. Um, Part of letting patients know about our um, cleanliness protocols has been to be really obvious about some things. Like we have two jars on the front desk that say clean pens and dirty pens. They get a whole bunch of questions, like I mentioned, when the phones person makes the appointment. And it just, I think, sends a signal that we're, we're taking this seriously. We also, quite frankly, are doing a lot more in the office than we ever have in terms of cleanliness. You know, we're wiping down the chairs with bleach wipes absolutely between every single patient and the whole room gets wiped down, all the doorknobs. So it's not, it's not window dressing, but we do sort of like to make it clear that we're doing that. So we have these very obvious, like dirty room tags that we hang on all the doors after the patient's been out. And then, you know, nobody knows to go in there. We also have been closing rooms down when there have been what we sort of deem aerosol generating procedures, whether it's somebody just coughed during a scope or if it was a procedure like an endoscopic control of a nosebleed or something like that. And so we have learned from the facilities people in our building how long it takes for the air to turn over. And, you know, we put a sticker on the door that says nobody can go in for 42 minutes and write the time. And so I think patients see that as well. Just in a lot of these things, reassuring patients is it's the same thing. And this is one of our, been our biggest challenges in 2020 is reassuring the staff, you know, to, to say like, it's gonna be safe for you to sit at the front desk. We have all these masks, we're doing everything we can to keep patients who we think might be sick out of the office. And so reassuring those two populations, our staff who we value and who are understandably anxious um, and our patients so that we can keep the practice running and keep taking care of Absolutely. people. Absolutely. Those two goals have been in parallel. And I think your tips, uh, you're reminding me, patients wonder about uh, the staggering of appointments and wait times. You know, why can't you fit me in today? And t- letting them know we're letting the room turn over for a certain amount of time and it takes time to clean, I think really helps. Dr. Patel. Mm-hmm. So I, I have a, a pediatric based practice. So um, it, when, uh, when the pandemic hit and uh, Florida shut down all elective surgeries, that's, that's the time period where we initiated telehealth. And it actually was 
fairly busy for the first um, month or so. And then I think um, most of the parents didn't really feel like they were getting out of it um, with what they were hoping. It was very hard to see tonsils. It's impossible to look at ears. You can't tell they have ear infections. So you could do post-op checks fairly well and, and you could do kind of an allergy follow-up based on you know pr primarily symptoms fairly well. So that I'm still using telehealth, but I'm seeing probably one or two patients every two weeks via telehealth. Now, um, unique to, I think, the pediatric practice is that um, in, in most daycares right now, masks um, over the age of two or three right now is being implemented. And so we're seeing a significant reduction in the number of viral infections, which means a significant reduction in the number of otitis media kids referred, sinusitis kids, and even strep throat. So from a surgical volume standpoint, um, most pediatric practices I I've engaged with, um, you know, their office volume is, is down and, and the surgical volumes are down, but contrarily, the allergy volume is sky high. And um, I I'm not sure I know how to explain that. Now, uh, the way our practice is set up, um, we, we have a Frasia check-in system, which um, we do, when they make the appointment, we send them a text um, to, to click on the link. And then Frasia has a list of 10 questions. Have you traveled anywhere? Do, do you have any of these symptoms? Have you had a fever? Have you been in contact with anybody that could? And if anything flags, then that prompts a phone call for, for my MA, who then will do a deeper screen at that point. So we're, before they even come into the office, the Frasia system already flags any potential patient. And so it, and, and on top of that, the Frasia system allows them to check in before they actually come to the office. Um, it, it allows us to text them when we're ready for them. So they can wait in their car if they want, they could wait in the hallway if they want. And when the room is ready, they come right through. And, and, and patients have been very, well, the parents have, have been very accommodating, understanding that, you know, we're not trying to jam the patients and we're not seeing 20 patients in a half day. You know, we're in you know, the volume trying to schedule between eight to 10, and then you add on a handful more uh, as emergency add-ons in the nosebleeds, the kids with foreign bodies that you got to see and, and try and get out. And just like the other panelists said, between every patient, you know, you wipe everything down, all the, do all the doorknobs and, and you, you know, show them that at your cleaning, everyone's wearing a mask and having plenty of equipment. If, if a parent comes in and they don't have anything, here's your mask. You know, we, we do require only one parent and one child. And, you know, it's, it's very common for a parent to want to come with four kids. And we just tell them, you know, if, if you have that, then we're just not going to be able to see you. I think you guys are bringing up some of the tips that I think are very important takeaways. Uh, I was just thinking about this, which is pediatric practice. You need a parent, one parent. You can't bring the whole family. However, that's two people. With adult practices, we've certainly been limiting unless you're older or there's a reason your family cannot come into the room. Sometimes that's tough. Sometimes I actually have conversations with our staff saying, I know we're not supposed to let anyone in, but this person has a tumor. so." it's okay. We're going to get the wife, text her. She's going to park the car and come on in too. So I think there are nuances to that. But in general, uh, one of the things that you guys have all highlighted so far is that I notice a lot of the tension for patients is the waiting area and the check-in area. And when they see few people, like just not a lot of human beings sitting there, not a lot, a lot of big line of people checking in, uh, we also use the texting methodology. Uh, we also do a call as a screening and try to get a lot of that intake done. Um, that is very reassuring. So I think a takeaway is keep the waiting area low, uh, stating that you only have limited people in the room. In fact, we took chairs away. I mean, it sounds funny and we didn't talk about it, but part of keeping things clean when my patients now ask, why are you leaving the room every three minutes in the beginning when we reopened? I said, well, because we don't keep anything in the room anymore. All the handouts and the figures and the photos and the things you can touch and the extra chairs and all the extra equipment is all outside in these locked drawers that we then open up for the day and we pop in and out for what we need. Uh, they appreciated that. They love hearing that there's really no chance that the tools I'm using on you, I might reach for with the next patient as well. What are your thoughts, Dr. Stackler, on, on what everyone said? 
And what are you doing differently? And, and really having gone into private practice, not too, not too long prior to this happening, how have you managed the engagement and re-engagement of patients? Well, it's pretty simple what I did. And I thought I did something pretty clever. Um, as soon as the academy came out with their recommendations and their guidelines, I went through line by line and I made a plan and, uh, and put it on our website about how we were going to run the office so people can see that right away I have a plan and this is well how this is our policies about how we're going to run the office and anytime there came updates I would incorporate that into my working draft about being open being ready now I did reject the idea of getting a um, special air purifier a 500 or 600 hundred dollar investment for every room because i really think that that was nonsense everybody's going to the store and everybody has that kind of exposure and i'm sorry but i'm i'm not of the belief that the aerosols stay in the air so much that i can't have people in and out of the rooms now i always clean the rooms in between patients i i immediately cleaned up my waiting room, I spiffed it up, I cut the chairs in half. I told patients if they come in and they see another patient while they're there, we fail. And our role is to make sure that nobody ever runs into somebody else. That's the rule. So I got them people sneaking out the back door. I got them coming in different times, different ways. I actually charge patients when they cancel their appointments. There's a $50 canceling fee because of COVID. And I said, you know, I'm scheduling you. If you call within 24 hours and you cancel your appointment and there's not a good reason, you're going to get, you're going to have a $50 fee because I'm, I'm limiting my practice for you and you're taking a spot from someone else. And I think that works really well because people value the time that they have and new patients, of course, you can't charge them a no-show fee and that's fine. But my allergies, I, I charge no shows for not coming in for allergy testing. And I really don't have a problem with people showing up. Um, I really am good about, I'm very fastidious about making sure people don't run into other, other uh, people while they're in my office. I think that's the key. And, and you just got to tell people, you know, we're, we're doing everything we can. And if they start getting into the aerosolization thing and, and, and over turn over times. I mean, I have three exam rooms. Um, I can't hold one for 42 minutes and say, I'm sorry, this is, it got 42 minutes to turn over. I can't do that, but I'm still very fastidious and very clean and, and people can see it uh, when we do the things that we do every day. That's awesome. I knew I knew it would be worth it to have Dr. Stackler speak. So I think you raised a couple of very interesting points. And so to wrap up this section, I will say, you know, if I take my kids to the dentist uh, and two of them have braces right now. So throughout the pandemic, they were first closed and then open. They did all of the things you said. Cancellation fee, uh, an extra stipulation of ten dollars or something for covid supplies very strict regimented scheduling, wait in the car, do not come up until we, until you get a text or call us. And here's the funny thing. I did it all. I happily followed it all. And yet, even as you're saying some of these things, we haven't implemented half of those rules about the changing of the flow of traffic. You know, people, the staff, they're used to doing things. And it has been a slow and important process to say, well, now we do things differently. So some of our staff that are MAs that would spend a long time in the room checking the patient in, uh, I think our infectious disease specialist came by at the beginning of our reopening in the summer and said, you can do that by phone. Having these conversations about who's your family doctor and registering the patient and do they have insurance, all those things happen. The time in the room is limited or guess what? I will make you sit in one room and call the patient in another room. And I think as the staff went through this and came to the conclusion, I think as Dr. Neubauer mentioned earlier, they also have to feel comfortable because someone who's being paid to be a receptionist at a medical office and is seeing the people first is very nervous about getting sick. And when you start reassuring them that I'm doing a flow through and a visit as rapidly as we can really helps them to feel better. 
The second thing I just want to highlight that Dr. Marzouk said is actually the model I've been following. I had had a lot of trouble with the, you know, you call someone and you don't reach them. And I wasn't initially such a big fan of telehealth, but it has become invaluable for a few tips. Uh, the first being the discussion around allergy testing and its risks and its benefits can be long and intense. How to prepare for the test, what we're going to do with the results. You've had surgery, you probably need either sublingual or skit. All of that is done by telehealth. So the minute we decide whether we're on a telephone visit or you're in person, we and I say, okay, now your next step is allergy testing. All I'm going to do is make the date and send you off. And then we're going to have a separate 20 minute discussion about the test because we actually don't, I find, I realize don't need to do that in the office and we are limited in our exam rooms. Um, similarly, the preparation for surgery. I mean, I go on and on, here's the risks, here's the discussion around surgery. You're gonna go over here to Cambridge or Mass Eye and here. Do I really need to have that face-to-face? -face? I have learned the hard way as much as I love the social interaction that we don't need that. And what patients appreciate is they schedule it at some convenient time, very close to the date. So the last thing I'll say is when you schedule someone for surgery, but they're not having surgery for two months, they might forget a lot of what you say, even a month later. But when you schedule that televisit the week prior and you go over everything and you go over their prescriptions, my compliance for doing things has really gone up. So I think that's another thing that you bring up, uh, Rob, where flowing people through. But I think that point, I just wanted to highlight, Dr. Merzuk, that point of you really are coming in as if we are proceduralists. And there is much social interaction and some patients do wanna stay and chat and you haven't seen them in a while, but they appreciate that there's a lot more back and forth talking between before and after. I probably spend more time with them now than when I was back to back booked you know, every 15 to 20 minutes. All right, so that's how we've been doing things. With 2021 looking slightly more optimistic than 2020, and with our hope that, you know, one day we'll soon be open, how are you guys planning in terms of the telehealth percentage or the scheduling within your practice? And what are you letting patients know as to what to expect about when they can sort of go back to the normal? Or, or are you saying, we're always gonna have a discussion about flow nase over telehealth because you don't need to see me in person to talk about how to use the nasal spray for the seventh time. So I'm gonna switch around a little bit. I'm gonna start with you, Dr. Stackler. What I do is I see in the future, I mean, my volumes, if I can see 10 in the morning and 10 in the afternoon, that's a pretty decent day. Um, and that either way, if people were really worried about coming in to see me in person, I offer them telehealth. I really have a hard time with somebody doing this and saying, hey, what's going on with my ear? Would you say you're 99% in person now then? Is that a fair statement? Yeah. I think that matches what you were saying, Dr. Patel, about it's actually really hard to examine kids in person, let alone to examine them with their parent holding them. Um, so is that a very similar model, I think, to what you have? Yeah, and but I I do plan to keep the telehealth going because th there are s some things that can be handled, and it's a minimal cost to keep it going. If a kid um, you know has had tonsils out and is doing great, that's a quick post op visit that can be done over over the internet, um, just as long as they're doing fine. But but the percentage wise, it's ninety nine percent in the office. That's important. I think that's good to hear. I'm gonna I'm gonna twist the story a little bit for you, Doctor Stackler. I'm not done. Here's my last question for you. What about geography? I will say that with telehealth, what we're finding in some areas is um, patients can interact even if they live far away or they're much closer to another hospital or another set of practices. Do you think that that could help you pick up patients in the future that you wouldn't have necessarily had immediate oh, geographic access? Absolutely. I mean, I'll do telehealth with anybody. I mean, I had a lot of patients that went down to Florida. And they're like, uh, you know, I'm going down to Florida. I'm not going to be able to see you. I said, oh, no, not true. We can see each <laughs> other now uh, without any hassles. But I, I really think that you've got to be careful about what you choose to see in telehealth. Telehealth 
is kind of like treating a family member um, from afar who wants you to call some eardrops in and you don't really know unless you ask them some poignant questions what they're having and you're kind of taking a shot at the dark on certain conditions it's most likely this and i'm going to treat you for this and i'm going to do this but i can't tell for sure grab a hold of your ear maybe that'll help me tell if it's an external ear infection or something going on put your finger in your ear open your jaw is this tmj i mean there's a lot of things that you can do that you would do if you were on the phone with somebody or what have you i think telehealth really has a place because now we can have all these discussions that we used to have to have in person. We can have them in telehealth. And the, the one thing I do want to ask mm -hmm. the panel members is how you're billing for it. Are you billing? I was told and I was informed by my billing company and by people giving telehealth uh, lectures that you actually bill for the time preparing the record, seeing the patient and preparing for the telehealth visit. Is that pretty standard for everybody or are you just billing the time on the phone or on in-person Zoom call? I'm gonna, I'm gonna let Dr. Hauser answer that and I love it. In classic Dr. Stackler fashion, you just like open the can of worms with the E&M coding and the billing changes and telehealth in 2021. But let's just say for 2021 with all the changes in place, Dr. Hauser, um, how are you billing for telehealth? And I think in the vein of the last two people, what percentage of telehealth are you doing in your in your practice? And do you anticipate doing moving forward? Well, our at my hospital, the, the telehealth, they try very hard to do the video type visits. I've not had luck with that at all. Um, you know, the patients going through Epic, it's difficult to actually get that to, to function appropriately. So for the most part, I'm doing telephone. Um, I don't enjoy it much, to be perfectly honest, because I really do think we get a great deal of information from our physical exam. So missing that component is very problematic. What I have found that, uh, that I've been able to phase in nicely is with kids. Like Dr. Patel was mentioning, for you know kids to get their tonsils out for sleep apnea, I, I do usually see them back once in the office, make sure they're healing well, but I like to see them in a delayed fashion, like three months later, to basically document that their sleep is good and I will clinically clear them of sleep apnea and take it off their record. I think that's the appropriate thing to do. Um, so, but that visit, since I already know they're healing well at a post-op visit, the delayed uh, sleep symptom discussion can take place perfectly well uh, via telehealth, via phone with mom, uh, you know, three months after surgery. So I've definitely phased that in and I'll continue doing that. I think that works out very well. The, f the families are very happy not having to drag the child in for that are purpose. You, are you saying, so in general, are you using telehealth when you're using it for more established patients? Is that a fair? If, if a person desires a uh, initial visit um, via telehealth, I've definitely done it that way. But for the most part, it's been for follow-ups, yes. But okay. we've had specifically some patients saying, I don't want to come in, but can I talk about it? And that's fine. I end up getting so much from scoping people and so forth. And as um, was mentioned, Dr. Mazouk saying kind of separating, sounds like getting history and so forth uh, via telehealth and then kind of separating out the, the scoping visit. Um, I don't think my office could handle that that, uh, that level of complexity. So I kind of have to divide it into the one. But, but what, um, what uh, Rob was saying about the billing, it mm -hmm. is not just the time spent with the patient. You do get to count the time that you are, you know, looking up their history to get ready for the call, the process of ordering things after the call and finishing the note and so forth. It's all the time that you've spent uh, in total is what makes up that visit. So that, that's how you end up billing that, selecting the times for that. Yeah, and I think, uh, you know, you both are raising an important point, which is probably a, to a good topic for another Zoomcast and a very complex one. And I think we have one on it, but if not, I've, I've seated the idea. Um, 
which is, you know, despite everything else with the pandemic, there's been coding changes. And then at least for now, telehealth has been running sort of in parallel with that. Um, and we'll see how long that lasts. But but I will say that, you know, it's interesting in, in otolaryngology and allergy, we're, we're doing a very, very hybrid and we're seeing a lot of people in person. But what I find around me in the hospital is there's a lot of primary care and internal medicine, you know, that is doing exactly what you're saying, Dr. Marzouk, about getting history taking. I want to go to Dr. Neubauer next for the simple reason that I think the reason that Dr. Hauser and I have more trouble is because we're in a hospital-based practice with central scheduling. And I was laughing and chuckling at the nimbleness of what you mentioned, which is I can do it, you know, you can do a telehealth visit with a patient on Monday and then fit them in on Tuesday or Wednesday if they need an in-person visit. That is no small feat in our practice and people are waiting long. So I think part of what you're saying, Steve, is there's this separation of time and I'm so forgetful and, you know, do I remember the history? So I'm very curious to see how you and Dr. Marzouk are handling the, the percentage of telehealth versus live, how you're billing for it and approaching it, especially for this coming year. So we're, we're, I'm probably 95% in person. I, however, I do have these like occasional calls where I have a question from the medical assistant or from the phones person to say, we're not sure if this person is appropriate for in the office. And I try to respond to their concerns, even if I sort of know in the back of my mind how it's going to go. And I might have a very brief telemedicine visit with them. For telemedicine, we use a couple different apps, Doxy, Doxy.me, which is a popular one, and then Doximity, which is great. It's Doximity Dollar. They have a video function. Um, and it's just you type in their cell phone number and hit video call and the patient picks up. It's essentially just like a HIPAA secure FaceTime call. And then I just ask them a few questions. If it leads to a telehealth visit or where we talk about the problem and I don't need to see them in the office, I'll bill for that. If it's if it's me just figuring out that they're fine to come in the office, I'll just hang up and then bill for the in-person visit and not bother with that. Sometimes I can have my medical assistant do that too, who might have a little bit more uh, knowledge of the questions to ask compared to the phones people. Um, one of the things about telehealth that I don't like is the imprecision, and this has been talked about, but you know, with the lack of a physical exam, I tend to overtreat and you sort of like you have to talk about this very broad range of di differential diagnoses that you know that if you could rule out in a second if you could just look in their ear. Um, so, so ultimately, I do think there's a place for it, but certainly, I hope it's a small place. <laughs> yeah. What do you think, Dr. Marzouk? You know, part of it is I think what I'm also hearing is you know we may also have telehealth fatigue. Mm -hmm. I'll tell you what, I was far more enthusiastic six months ago and I would have sessions where they were in person and then telehealth. And now I groan if the in-person ends and there's a few televisits booked for the afternoon. So how are you guys handling it in your practice? So I would say at this point, I'm probably 90%, 10%. Keep in mind in central New York, we have a, we have a very large geographic in cap area as opposed to kind of Boston, New York, where the density is a little bit different. So there are people who come an hour and a half to see me to do ear tube checks. So the telehealth sometimes, you know, helps us a little bit, especially in the winter months. So I would say at this point, I'm 90, 10. Uh, we bill actually with video as much as we can, because then we do a visit code with a modifier 95. Mm -hmm. Um, and then uh, when I can't do video, either for technical difficulties, poor resolution, whatever, I usually do the telephone visits and then bill by time. Um, typically for 2021, it, it really depends, you know, now you telehealth, like a lot of the exceptions being made uh, are on a temporary still emergency basis. They haven't become permanent. Right. Should they become permanent, it's kind of a different ball game, right? So right now I do a lot of telemedicine as a matter of um, patient preference or convenience if I feel it's appropriate, right? So I can't look at ear tubes, for example, or examine kids with certain issues via telehealth. I don't offer it as a follow-up. I offer it, you know, I say telehealth, telemedicine is okay. We can do it that way. For for example, I've scoped you. I'm just following up your Flonase refill. How's everything going? Things like that. Uh, as opposed to things that where I know I need to scope the patient or uh, I know I need to do certain things on the physical exam that I'm not going to be able to get on telehealth, then I don't, I don't offer it. So it's kind of where appropriate offering it as kind of a, a, a patient preference thing. There are patients who want to come in and, and we have protocols set up for that. We do have a handout that we've prepared with actual um, screenshots 
uh, for the patients on how to download our platform, how to join audio, how to do this. So for kids, for example, we had mentioned difficulties with the exam, how to take a picture of the inside of their mouth with a flash with the back of a spoon and then how to share that on the screen. We have handouts for wow. those things <laughs> to help the cool. kind of walk the patients through um, how to do that so that when I'm on, I'm not sitting there being an IT person as much as I can. I have to anyway, but kind of down bringing down that that amount of uh, that sort of stuff. And for people who are savvy with their websites to post those handouts on the website tends to be helpful too. The nice thing about the pediatric population is that the parents tend to be younger. So they sometimes they're a bit more tech savvy, um, you know, working with the platforms. So again, in 2021, if it becomes permanent, actually, I don't know if you guys have any experience with Wi-Fi otoscopes. You can get it for 40 bucks on Amazon. Mm -hmm. And and the image is great. You know, one of the things I thought of that's kind of my pie in the sky ideas is if it, the telemedicine stuff becomes permanent for some of my patients who are coming two hours such, you know, we put in tubes, you offer for them to, to buy Wi-Fi otoscopes uh, to get, you know, ear exams for those, you know, again, these people that you know, yes. you need to look at the eardrums over and over. So those are those are all things that we're going to kind of Again, if telemedicine becomes more permanent part of our practice, certain things that we can weave in and out, just like people are getting digital stethoscopes and doing that remotely with their cardiologist as well. Yeah, this is so interesting. So um, in closing, I'm, I'm going to ask you guys for something tricky that I didn't set you up for, but not hard, which is if each of you can comment on something you learned from another panelist, just a pearl or a tip that you may use or think about. Um, and I will also leave you with the thought that as we had this discussion around telehealth, you know, I think we enjoy the social aspect because believe it or not, otolaryngology, there's so much to the physical exam, but I was shocked in a conversation with the ophthalmologists, how they're using the technology of the iPhone and different gadgets that were never popular, like this, this otoscope for years. And they're doing eye exams and they're doing them through televisits and those not full eye exams, but screening ones. Um, and once they said that, it becomes very difficult to say, well, I can't, you know, look at your face or have you show me some part of your nose. Um, so I think there's a long way to go, but I think we're all waiting, as you said, Dr. Marzouk, we're kind of waiting also to see how it impacts our practice, right? Are these measures permanent or temporary? Um, my big takeaway was your handout. I love that idea. So I'll start. Um, we send a lot of handouts about, you know, information about how to download, but we didn't do anything about, gosh, take a photo of the lesion or the rash or the tongue that your child has and preload it this way so that I can see it without going through that. And I think part of the reason I haven't enjoyed telehealth is that part is sort of talking through all the things they have to do on themselves or a family member, um, and then you just sort of get frustrated and give up and try to like have our wonderful physician assistant do as much of that in his televisit. Um, so I think that's my big takeaway. But what do you what have you guys learned and taken away from each other? Because I think that's what's relevant about these Zoom casts. So I'll start with you, Dr. Patel. Um, I, I like the idea of the Wi-Fi uh, otoscope. I, I had uh, um, I've seen it on the internet, but I haven't tried it out. And I'd be interested to have it come in and see if parents can actually use it effectively in the office first and then implement that as a telemedicine to, for the follow-up ear tubes. I would save them a lot of time and uh, it might be convenient. Perfect, Dr. Neubauer. Well, I'll say two things. One is the, the text messaging app that would allow the patients to say, to screen them to say, do you have a fever exposure to COVID? That they could do that without having to stay on the phone with them. I mean, that would be really good. So something I think I'll look into. And then secondly, to be able to more effectively use telehealth to maybe get the history and the stuff you could you don't really need to look at them to be able to do, and then come in for that sort of procedure visit we talked about. Hmm. Dr. Stackler. I um I have a comment about uh, the Wi-Fi uh, otoscopes, which are kind of neat because I kind of stumbled. <clears throat> on the Wi-Fi otoscopes and I got kind of into this trying to figure out how I can project ear images on my iPhone and also 
on a monitor. So I bought one of these DEPSEC, uh, DEP, DEPTEC, DEP, T-E-C-H. It's made in China. Um, it's a handheld uh, little um, wand that uh, puts images on your iPhone. It was only about 40 bucks. And then I bought a $60 one that has a little, little screen. And I've been playing around with that in the last week or two. So it's very pertinent. I think that it's hard to get the little wand in so you can get a really good look at the ear. I was trying to play around with it myself and thinking to myself, goodness gracious, I'm an ENT and I'm having trouble doing this. So I wonder um, how other people are going to be learning how to do that. I think that's the future um, about uh, getting those cameras to people and getting that to project on our screens. One thing I wanted to also mention, all of our patients are coming back to us and are seeing us through Google. And Steve Hauser taught me how to get onto my Google account and, and own my Google uh, website and all the reviews and, and just start doing the internet thing. He Search engine, to optimizing, it. yeah. And, and I now optimize it. I have just, I've got internet materials and, and stuff I use in the office through GoDaddy and I had them starting to market my practice. They came in, did a photo shoot. They Now I'm marketing Twitter, Instagram and Facebook. I get more referrals from the internet now than I get from doctors and it's a big deal. So I, if anybody out there watching this, you need to update all of your internet information and get that up to par because I'm telling you, that's the new white and yellow pages. And I learned yeah, I, that from Steve. Yeah, I will say, and then and then we'll end with you, Dr. Hauser. I will say thank you for reminding me. Um, you know, when I brought up geography and reach with telehealth, having more patients that are coming to see you for the things that you like to treat, whether it's allergy, whether it's rhinology, whether it's pediatrics, whether it's general, means that you have to be conversing on the platforms that they converse in. And it could be Facebook, but as my kids tell me, now it's more about Instagram and Twitter. Um, it's websites. And guess what? People sitting at home read everything about you before they come in. It's sort of unbelievable. Look at pictures. It's um, So whatever you can do to get that going, uh, it's actually fairly simple. And I think a lot of the, the practices here that are private have just, you know, you've got that simple intake form. My takeaway with that, Rob, to echo what you're saying is, I don't know, look at the dentists. They seem to do a great job. You can do everything through their websites, including your intakes, your video visit, your forms, your insurance. And by the time you get there, you're just going into the chair and out. And I feel like that's not a great model because I like to chat with people, but it's a great model to keep people safe while COVID is around and make them- I have comfortable. all my stuff on the internet. People can download their all their information they have to fill out. I don't have a really great way that they can do it and get it back to me online so I can load it. But I, you know, people can fax it. They can scan it. Those, if the, my office staff get it before I get to it, they can load everything and it can make right. the visit so much easier. So I have been trying that as much as I can. Steve, Dr. Hauser, what has been your biggest takeaway? Well, just to mention the the issue with the uh, the search engine optimization and so forth, that that is probably a good topic. Maybe we ought to put that on the yeah. list to do one of these about <laughs> with screenshots and so forth, because all of our members should claim their Google business site, because then anytime somebody is at a nearby place, because it's very geo specific their name pops up. But just to amplify the video um, otoscopes, there's actually video endoscopes too. Now, because I deal with uh, patients that uh, potentially have empty nose syndrome, these are very motivated patients and they're literally all over the world. So I will have patients, you know, you can buy endoscopes, uh, flexible endoscopes uh, online as well. And these, cause these are partially used by, for example, plumbers. Uh, electricians, yes. so yes. they can go inside a wall and, and look, and, and, and car, you know, car folks, so they can look inside these areas. So these have been available for a long time now, and they've gotten smaller and better refined. 
And actually, uh, they have these that you can put in the nose as well. So I've not ever advised people to do that, but I've definitely had empty nose patients who have on their own gotten such a device, you know, made a video of their nose, sent that to me, et cetera. Um, so that would be an interesting thing to try to uh, add on um, and maybe would make our physical exam more feasible. Looking at a face it really doesn't tell me a whole lot about the nose, right. but if I could look in the nose, then yeah, that could that could be very interesting. So I, I appreciate uh, that thought. It's interesting. Yeah. Amazing. Well, thank you so much, guys. You've given me so much of your time today. Uh, the AOA and the members want to thank you. They're, I'm sure we could talk a lot about so much in so many directions that this is going, but it sounds like we covered the gamut. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and close out this Zoomcast session, and uh, hopefully this will get watched far and wide, and we'll get all kinds of criticism and reviews, which is what we want. Uh, wonderful. Thank you so much.